If you've been in church for a while, you probably have participated in the Lord's Supper before, perhaps many times. And it's my desire this morning for us to go, as we participate in the Lord's Supper, to go back and into history and find out a little bit about the history of where the Lord's Supper came from. And so on the back side of your order of service, I've put kind of an outline. If you want to follow that, go along, that would be great. And if you don't, I understand that too, if you're just going to pay attention. Passover and the Lord's Supper. We know about the original Passover that's recorded for us in Exodus chapter 12. And Moses is given the instructions to tell the people on the 14th day of the 10th day of the month to tie up a lamb and on the 14th day of the month at twilight to sacrifice the lamb and you can read that in in, you know as for your homework tonight Um, so I don't want to take the time to go through that and actually read that but the first Passover is the Egyptian Passover all the other Passovers or Seders since then are actually a memorialization of that first Passover so we're going to talk a little bit about the original Passover We're going to talk about how the Jews celebrated Passover for the next 1,500 years until Jesus came. And then we'll talk a little bit about what changes have come since Jesus' time on the face of the earth. So the original Passover was done in haste, if you remember. They were told to eat standing up, tuck your cloak into your belt, and be ready for on the evening of the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn, The way to be able to provide protection was to be able to sacrifice the lamb, to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost and lentils and that door of their house. And that way, when the death angel passed over, he would pass over that house instead of executing the tenth plague. And so the word Passover, and actually the celebration, comes from what's called a Seder, S-E-D-E-R. It means order of service. Okay, so one of the things that goes up, talk about the original Passover, and we understand that, you can read that, it's printed for you. What may not be printed for you, maybe so easier to find, would be actually the celebration of the Seder. So let's talk about that a little bit. Jewish families have been celebrating the Seder since the original Passover, so about 1,500 years until Jesus' time. So here's one of the things that goes on. The house needs to be clean. It needs to be purged of leaven. Okay, so the family would go around and clean the house. The father and the children run around with a candle and a napkin and a spoon, and they would go looking for any little bits or crumbs of bread or cookie or anything that's left over that might have leaven in it. Of course, we know that mom and grandma have already cleaned the house and gotten rid of all the leaven. But the guys make a little game of it, and so they would take whatever little bits they could find, and they take it, and they'd take it to the town center and throw it in a bonfire, and the father or grandfather would be able to declare, my house is free from leaven. Of course, leaven was representative of sin, and so in the week of preparation for Passover, they go through and they clean their house and get rid of all sin. Now, today, if Jewish family, if you're in Israel, in in the United States, if you're a Jewish family and you want to rid the leaven from your house, what you do is take all your baked goods and you sell them to your Gentile neighbor for a dollar, and then after Passover is over, you buy them back for an hour, put them back in your house. But the symbolism still, they're the same. They're cleansing the house from sin. Everything dealing with Passover or the Seder is done in white. Therefore, the white tablecloth today, the white linen, white candles would be on the table, special plates. Uh, a Jewish family would have special plates that they would bring out and use only for Passover. And everything is in white because his white is talking about right. And that was a reminder about righteousness. Candles on the table. It's interesting. Women do have very little to do in leading uh, religious services in Judaism. But in this situation, it was the mother or grandmother of the house that was responsible for coming and lighting the candles. The lighting of the candles actually began the Seder, the beginning of the service. And so that... um, privilege was given to the mother or the grandmother in the house, which is kind of interesting if you fast forward at Jesus' time. It is Mary, the mother of Jesus, that brings us the light of the world. And so there's a lot of symbolism contained in those two things. And then you see four cups on the table. And the verbs for these come from four different verbs in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Gene's going to put them up there on the screen for us. 
I hope. There you go. So Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7 says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, I will bring, first cup, bring you out under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I'll explain this as we go along. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and muddy acts of judgment, and I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And then there's three beds. Uh, you can't see it, but I've got three, a three-pouch linen garment up here, and there's three pieces of bread, matzah, that are actually put into each one of those, and there's three breads. Now, the three breads we could be representative of the priests, the Levites, and the people. could be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but in our situation, we're going to use them as a reminder about the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Now, rabbis were responsible for how the Seder evolved. Okay? So if you're in one church, in some kind of event this way, they would do it their way. If you were in a different church, they would do it that way. If you're in a different family, the, the information or the celebration that you do, you do at Christmas time or Thanksgiving or Easter or birthday parties or something like that evolves. So the Seder has also evolved. So we can't necessarily say that it's definitely the priests, the Levites, and the people because some rabbinical teachings say, no, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our fathers. Okay? So you get a little bit of variance in the 1,500 years before Jesus. Then Father would take the first cup. This is the cup of sanctification. Sanctification, of course, means to be set apart. Over, look over the table. He would drink from that cup and thereby say, everything is in order. We are now being set apart. And so Father would drink from that cup, and then each one of the individuals around the table would would drink from that cup. Then he would go to the center loaf of the three loaves of bread. Pouch. He would take one out of the center for purposes representing the sun. He would break it in half. He would put it in a different linen pouch and he would take it and put it aside or bury it now, the Jewish families have a little game that they play with this. They would take it, and if you put it in a sofa or over in the corner or something like that, it's called the afikoman, but Father's going to retrieve that later on in the service and bring it back. It's kind of the dessert. It's referred to afikoman, which means that which comes after. But we're going to so that in a minute. And then the four questions would ask, and Gene's got the four questions up there for us. Remember that the, this is a memorial service, so it's all used for teaching time. They're passing the information down. So the youngest child who could read would ask these questions. Why is this night distinguished from all other nights? On this night, we eat only unleavened bread. And then Father would use that opportunity to explain to them, well, it was unleavened bread from the original Passover. And so as a commemoration of that, we eat only unleavened bread. Or it's a reminder of no sin. It's a reminder of the fact that our ancestors left in haste. They didn't leave time for the bread to rise and therefore produce leaven. So he uses it for a teaching tool. On the second, they say, on all these other, all the other nights we eat vegetables, and on this night we eat bitter herbs. Well, the bitterness is a reminder of the bitterness of slavery of 400 years. We were under Pharaoh's direction, forced, forced labor to make bricks for a period of 400 years. And so it's a reminder of the bitterness that our ancestors went through. On all other nights we don't dip our food even once, and on this night we dip twice. There's a bowl of salt water in the center of the Seder plate, and they would actually dip that in there. And the other nights they wouldn't dip, but on this night they would dip either the matzah, the bread, or parsley, the herbs, and they would put that, dip them in a reminder. And, you know, it was a reminder going through the Red Sea, and then the first time going through the Red Sea, the second time the fact that God used the same thing that they had just come through on dry ground to drown Pharaoh and his army to provide protection for them. And then the fourth question, on all other nights we are sitting, but on this nights we only recline. See, reclining was a sign of freedom. Jane, I think if you got a, we have a slide, one more be fine before that. It's called a triclinium, okay? This is the seating arrangement that Jesus and his disciples probably would have sat at. It's a Roman idea, but the Jews at this time were following it because of the, the, uh, the oppression of the Romans in the area, so that kind of influence. And you can tell who, I don't know, the, 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 the letters are small for you to read back there. The lower left-hand corner would be the host, 
and going around the table clockwise would be the letter of significance. So Peter, in a sitting over on the far right-hand side, would actually be the most honored guest. Sitting next to Jesus in the second seat would have been John, and in the seat on the other side of him would have been Judas. And if you remember the story from the New Testament, when Jesus indicates to his disciples that one of them is going to betray them, he said, it's the one who dips with me. Well, the three of them would have been seated side by side, and generally the dipping was done by three people. So John would be on one side, Judas would be on the other side, and Jesus in the middle. And so John's asking the questions. He knows it's not him that's going to betray. So that tells him immediately that Judas is the one that's going to betray Jesus. You look at that in, in uh, John chapter 13. You can look that up for homework also. Hope you're writing this homework down. Okay. So he takes the first cup of sanctification. He takes the hidden bread. They go through the four questions. And then the Passover story is remembered. And the Passover story comes from Exodus chapter 12. We can read through that. I'm not going to take the time to do that this morning because there again, you can read that when you get home and find the significance of it. But it's talking about the actual experience of the Passover, the Egyptian Passover, which is the first Passover, the only Passover, if you speak of it that way. Remember that all other Passovers are memorials of the Egyptian Passover. And then Father takes the second cup. It's a cup of deliverance. And he recites the ten plagues as he drops drops of ten drops of wine onto each person's plate all the way around the table. He would remind them what they've come from and remind them that this cup represents the deliverance that has brought them out of Egypt. And the meal. It would be a meal very often similar to what we would have on a Christmas or a, uh, let's say, Easter or Thanksgiving, an elaborate meal. Uh, it's taken a while to prepare the meal. You've got many friends and family come over to celebrate the meal, and it's, you know, it's probably an elaborate meal. It's going to take a couple hours to go through. Generally, the meat was lamb up until about A.D. 70. A.D. 70, the temple was destroyed, and so after that, it would be inappropriate to use a lamb because a lamb could no longer be sacrificed. And so they would use different meats, maybe chicken, obviously not pork or shellfish or anything like that because of Levitical restrictions. So the meal was a meal that took them quite a while. And, you know, all this time, Father's using this time to be teaching time and reminding the children and the grandchildren of their heritage and where they've come from and how they've gotten out of bondage. The meal by the time of the New Testament had taken on quite a different meaning. If you remember Paul's chastisement of the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, you know, for this matter, I do not give you any praise. Because by that time, the, the Passover celebration or the Seder celebration had been degraded to the fact that it was a love feast. They had forgotten the original intent of the meal and they just wanted to have a picnic, effectively. And so, we always have to be careful before we celebrate the Lord's Supper of having the proper attitude. This song that the praise team is going to sing will help us be able to do that as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper.
something different with his disciples. He takes the elements that we've recognized as the bread and the third cup and institutes something new with them. Often, there's an extra cup on the table, not the fourth cup, the fifth cup that's actually called Elijah's cup because the Jews are looking for the literal fulfillment of Malachi 4.5. It says, I will send you Elijah before the dreadful day of the Lord, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to their fathers. And so sometimes the Jews, even now today, will set a place at the table for Elijah to come. The youngest child will run out, open the front door, maybe they'll leave the front door ajar, he'll run out into the street, look up and down the street to see if Elijah is coming to the meal. 
But of course, Elijah has already come in the form of John the Baptist. So at the end of the meal, everything's over with, typically. Now, they've been practicing this or, or celebrating this for 1,500 years. And Jesus has certainly been celebrating it, at least with his disciples, for three years. But, you know, as an adult male for several years before that, the meal is over. Everything's done. Except now, Jesus reaches and takes two elements. He takes the middle piece of bread, the afikoman, that which has been buried and brought back to life. And he takes the third cup. So he reaches for the hidden bread and he says to his disciples, this is my body which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And he passes it to each one of the disciples. The blessing is not recorded for us in the New Testament, unfortunately, because Jesus uses even the blessing from the Seder to talk about himself. The blessing is, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Jesus had been telling his disciples for the last three years that he must set his face towards Jerusalem, and that he must go to Jerusalem and he must die, and they don't really understand all that that means. But he's always reassured them, I will come back. And even if you, if you read John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you, but if I... If I Go and prepare a place for you. I'll come back and receive you unto myself there I, that you may be there where I am. He's assuring his disciples that they're not going to be alone. That after three days, God would bring him forth. And so he takes this broken piece that's been buried and he resurrects that piece and he gives it to the disciples to share them. King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he uses that to point to himself. He was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, meaning the house of bread. He said, I am the manna which has come down out of heaven. He's used illustrations about bread. The, the Jews were looking for a Messiah who would provide a miraculous multiplication of bread. He has fulfilled all those things. And so through the bread, he's given them an illustration of himself. Men, would you distribute the bread, please? the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the dark your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living. So great a mercy, heart could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and wear my shame. Cross has spoken. I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful 
after what we've learned, why bread? When John the Baptist announced Jesus coming and he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus could have said, this Lamb represents my body. But 3,500 years ago and through the 1,500 years that the Jews were celebrating it, Lamb was not a common item to be eaten. It was a special item. It first had to be sacrificed in the temple and then taken home and eaten as part of the Passover. And so some lamb's not something that they had on a regular basis. We eat meat on a regular basis and think nothing of it. But if you travel in Israel these days, you don't get a whole bunch of meat. So why would he choose bread? Well, bread is a very common thing. In Israel, it's eaten with every meal. How was the bread cooked? People didn't have an oven in their house. They went to a community bake. And you would say, you know, there was a baker in town. He scheduled 15-minute periods for you to <clears throat> create all the matzo that you wanted to make. And so, you know, you would take all of your ingredients and you'd go to the bakery and you would mix it all up and you'd throw it in the oven and get it back out again. And this happened on a regular basis. Often you would bake enough bread to last you through the week, even when you ate it at three different meals during the day. It was a common thing. Probably why Jesus chose the bread as a reminder, because the folks saw the bread usually three times a day. Even in his model prayer, he said, a reminder to give us this day, what? Our daily bread. So he chose the bread, I think, probably, because it was common. Every family had access to it. Every family used it on a regular basis, and so he wanted them, when they looked at the bread, to remember him. So when he sits down with his disciples on the night of Passover, he knows that in less than 24 hours, he's going to be arrested, tried, and crucified. And so he reminded his disciples, do this as you remember me. Then he reaches for the third cup, the cup of redemption. And he blesses the cup, and here's his prayer out of the Seder. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, <coughs> creator of the fruit of the vine. Now in the Gospel of John, in chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, you have the farewell discourse. And in chapter 15, Jesus talks specifically about the vine and the branches and the fruit. Stay attached to the vine. Stay attached to the branches, and you will produce fruit. And so he's talking about two different things. One, fruit, 
of introducing people to him and having a personal relationship with him. But even as Paul wrote in the New Testament, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are things that ought to be exhibited out of our relationship when we stay connected with the vine. So he gave the cup to the disciples and he said, I want to institute a new relationship with you. And I love you and I offer you my life. Men, would you distribute the cup? trips to Israel, I was visiting with our Israeli guide, and he was explaining to me Jewish matrimonial customs. And he told me something about marriage and proposal and stuff like that, and I realized at the time he didn't have, he didn't have an understanding of the significance of the things he was telling me. See, for, in Jesus' day, when a young man was interested in the prospect of a young lady as a bride, now normally marriages were arranged, but in this situation, a young man sees a young lady and he's interested in her as a bride, he and his dad would go to their house, to 
the bride's house and pour a cup of wine and offer it to the prospective bride. He didn't have to say anything because as he poured a cup of wine, what he was saying to her is, I, I love you, I offer you my life, will you be my bride? And she had an opportunity to, to reject the cup. Maybe a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. So she could reject it or accept it, but she didn't have to respond in words. If she took from the cup, what she was saying back to him is, I received the gift of your life and I offer you mine in return. And so Jesus, when he took that cup of redemption that night and he shared it with his disciples, was basically saying the same thing to them. I love you. Will you be my bride? This represents a new covenant or a new relationship amongst people. And so I thought, you know, every time that we participate in the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity to respond like that. Jesus comes to us this morning in the form of this cup, and he says to each of us individually, I love you. I offer you my life. And we have an opportunity to respond. When we respond, if we drink from the cup, what we're saying to him is, I receive the gift of your life, and I give you mine in return. Not the willingness to die, more so the willingness to live for him. And so Jesus says to his disciples that night, do this as you remember me. There's a fourth cup on the table, and it uses the verb take. Jesus didn't drink from that, but he did mention it. He said, furthermore, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And so they left and they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. He was arrested and betrayed and crucified. But a couple of days later, he rose. For the Jews, the spring feast would be Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was a reminder about not eating bread with leaven. But then the day following their Sabbath, their Sabbath being on Saturday, their day following their Sabbath is the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus, at his resurrection, became the first fruits for you and for I, for me. So here's our invitation this morning as the praise team gets ready to lead us in singing. Maybe you've never had a relationship with this Jesus. Maybe you've never really had a personal relationship with him. He desires that. He gave his life to know you personally. So you'd have that relationship personally. Maybe this morning as we've been going through the operation of the Seder and the Passover and the Lord's Supper, you realize that you're not walking as close to him as you should and that you need to reprioritize some of the things in your life. And so you can make that decision today. You can make it where you seat, where you're seated or where you're going to stand in a moment or you can come down and talk to Pastor John or myself will be down front. Maybe there's some other need that you recognized in your life this morning that doesn't, it's not related to those two, but it sure is something that you'd like to have somebody pray about with you. And so we'll be down front to be able to greet you. So whatever the decision is, as we begin to sing this song, I pray that the Holy Spirit will prompt you and enable you and strengthen you to be able to make that decision. Let's stand together.